Very good, Mr. Upson and Ms. Hall. I see both of you in our virtual courtroom. Ms. Hall, you may proceed. Don't forget to let me know if you wish to reserve rebuttal time. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court. I'm Sarah Hall of Ratzel and Andrus, and I represent the appellant, defendant Elizabeth Parisi. I would like to reserve five minutes for rebuttal. Very good. There, Parisi appeals from two trial court orders, so there are two issues on appeal. The first order is a June 7th, 2021, denial of Parisi's motion to disqualify the trial court. The second order and second issue is a February 5th, 2021, trial court order granting plaintiff Caviola's motion for entry of default final judgment, where there was no notice to Parisi from Caviola's counsel, the clerk, or otherwise. So the two main questions are whether the trial court erred in denying Parisi's legally sufficient verified motion to disqualify the trial judge, and whether the trial court erred when it entered an order granting plaintiff Caviola's motion for entry of default final judgment without notice, and where there were two undisposed pending motions, the determination of either or both of those motions would have affected the party's rights to proceed with the litigation. And so disposition ruling upon them would have been required prior to entering a default final judgment. Briefly, the facts of the case that are relevant are that Caviola, the plaintiff below, served my elderly client, defendant Parisi, with this lawsuit, the instant lawsuit. At the time of the service, Ms. Hall, Ms. Hall, we've read yes, the briefs and are familiar with the record. Let's talk about your contention that the trial court erred in entering the final judgment. That you, as I understand your arguments, you claim that the trial court was, the error is that the trial court should have ruled on the pending motion you had filed to vacate the non-final order that you later sort of converted to a motion to, be, to set aside the clerk's default and that the trial court violated rule 1.500B by entering the default without notice to the defendant. And my questions to you about those two points are, didn't the trial court effectively rule on your motion that was directed to either the non-final order or the clerk's default. And two, 1.500B applied to the clerk's default, not to the, the court's entry of final judgment. That's the text of the rule. So at the time that clerk's default was entered, you had affirmatively rejected a request to accept service and indicated that you weren't representing the defendant. So those are my two questions about your points to the merits of the orders on appeal. Um, as I understand it, your first question was, didn't the court effectively rule on the motion to vacate? Yes, uh, because he told you, I've, uh, the effect of my non-final order is that it is a final judgment. I just need to sign the, the final form. So I've already made that decision, I'm telling you. And therefore, what you should do is wait for me to sign it and you can bring a 1.540B motion directed to it. How much more did he have to do to make clear that he had disposed of your motion? I, I would disagree that there was a ruling on the merits of the motions. The issue and what has continued to be an issue is what your honor has raised, that the court at some point at one hearing, and I, I believe it was the June 1st hearing, the court indicated that well, my order granting was effectively a final judgment that, you know, if, if Caviola's counsel had submitted the default uh, judgment, I would have signed it. However, for whatever reason, counsel did not. However, at the prior hearing that was continued, so there, were, there was no ruling, the court said, this is just an order. This has no effect, despite the fact that the order has granted affirmative relief. So Parisi has been left in quite the quandary of, well, is this order granting something that grants well, well, Let's talk about that quandary because within days of the June hearing, the trial judge did enter a final judgment. And at that moment, it, the transcript makes pretty plain that the judge had all but given you legal advice on what to do about that final judgment when it was entered. 
wouldn't you be in a much better posture if you had brought a 1.540 motion to vacate the final judgment? We had at that point, Your Honor, pending two separate motions. And because of the different conversations back and forth during the two, mo the two hearings, excuse me, it was unclear whether the order granting had the effect of a judgment or if it did not. So the first motion to vacate was filed based on the facts as understood at that point. And then the hearing was set. The judge wouldn't hear the merits of it, but said to the counsel, go back and discuss. And then once there was the continued attempt to resolve and figure out exactly what the effect of the order was, then there was the larger motion that was filed, which was, it made clear that it's unclear what's going on with the order granting, whether it has the effect of a default. So if it is a final judgment, here is the basis, then there was no notice. Well, then let's talk about then your, the motion and you filed a couple of them. If Whether you cast it as a motion to set aside the clerk's default or a motion to vacate the non-final order, under either of those constructs, you had a burden to show excusable neglect, surprise and inadvertence, you agree? Yes. What evidence, what record evidence, as opposed to attestations of counsel? Is there an affidavit in here? Is there a verified pleading that is record evidence of excusable neglect? There is a verified pleading. The motion to, the verified motion to disqualify the judge, Parisi herself outlines the situation with the confusion but and the other that's, that's not your motion to, that, that motion to disqualify the judge was directed solely to disqualifying the judge. It is still an affidavit and verified, well, testimony of Parisi. And after filing the motion to vacate the second motion, which I believe was filed June 4th or June 3rd, was sometime in June of 2021, requests were immediately made for an evidentiary hearing with the judge, which went on Where's the record on that? I was looking for where that request for evidentiary hearing showed up in this Unfortunately, record. the procedure that's employed in this case and this in Lee County overall is to request a hearing by letter. So it's not in the docket. It is simply a letter that's sent to the court that was never- But what, what record evidence do we have besides your representation? Other than there is not an evidentiary hearing, I am unaware, as I sit here today, if there is any record evidence. Suffice to say, that is the procedure, or was the procedure, I do believe it's changed in Lee County, was to send a letter to the court requesting hearing time, and it did go unanswered. Ms. Hall, I'm going to go back to something you said a few moments ago, and you said in your brief. Am I understanding correctly that your view was the order entered by the court on February 5th of 2021. Your view is that was a final judgment? The order granting the motion for entry of default has the language that would seem required in a final judgment. It grants affirmative relief. And so- Does it, does it, award, does it award the damages that are requested? There were not damages awarded. Wasn't that the basis of the complaint? The basis of the complaint was to ask for, I believe, the partition of the house. And if I could pull up the order, I could make, yes, I could refer to it specifically if I may have one moment. It's at record 58. It is at record 58. So the order granting plaintiff's motion for entry of default final judgment grants the request for specific performance and accounting. So that is the, the relief that was requested by plaintiff and it is granted in that order granted. But the, the order also says final judgment will be entered by separate order. I agree that it says that. However, granting the granting of affirmative relief in this order does seem to have all of the operative language for a final judgment. And it does, and the court did indicate in the June 1st hearing that this in effect has no different operation because all he would need to do, which he had already decided to do at that point, was to sign an order or to sign a final judgment. Where, so, where in that order does it direct your client to execute a deed? I 
I do not believe it does, Your Honor. However, isn't that, it does isn't that what count? Well, hang on, isn't that what count one asks for? Specific performance, including requiring that a deed be executed conveying an undivided one half interest. It does. However, this order granting does grant the relief requested, which is the specific performance. How does it do that when it doesn't direct performance of anything? Well, and Your Honor, that's exactly what we were trying to sort out below. And okay. we well, let's to... talk about that. So you're trying to sort this out below and the court says, look, here's what you need to do. You filed a motion. It doesn't really go to a final judgment because the final judgment hasn't been entered. We're going to need to uh, get that entered. And then you can challenge the final judgment and raise whatever you want to change. And if I recall correctly, you basically say, OK. Right. I do not recall what I said. at the hearing. Well, you didn't say, Judge, you're wrong. You can't do that. And here's why you can't do that. Am I right about that? Or do you not remember that either? No, I would not have stated so boldly in front of the no, court. You may not. Did you tell the court? Judge, we're here and here's why we have to go forward with a, either an evidentiary hearing or whatever we need to do. You didn't tell the judge that. You basically said, I understand what the court is saying and that's fine. And based on what the court was saying, my understanding and belief was that, well, if this is not a final judgment, then there needs to be a motion to vacate the default to address the actual merits of the case, to get to the actual issues. And, and so filed, that's why you, we filed the second motion. When you filed the motion to vacate, did you file any affidavit by your client or by anyone setting out what the excusable neglect was or what the meritorious affirmative defenses would be? The affirmative defenses, my recollection is, had been filed with the answer. No, that's not what I asked you. Counsel, that's not what I asked you. I asked you, did you or your client file an affidavit in connection with the motion to vacate? The affidavit, the verified motion was filed the day after. So it was not filed contemporaneous with the June 3rd motion, no. So the verified motion that you're referring to is what record page? Is that the one dated February 5th? I think you said that the verified motion was the one to disqualify Judge Kyle, which was filed the day after. It was filed the day after. Filed the motion to. The and my question motion. is, when you filed the motion to vacate, I think you just said that it was verified. I don't see a verification on the motion to vacate. So did you file anything of an evidentiary nature in support of the motion to vacate? It was not, there was nothing filed in the form of an affidavit or a verified motion contemporaneous. The day after was the filing of the verified motion to disqualify, which outlines the- But the motion to disqualify was not referencing the motion to vacate. It did not support the motion to vacate. Is that correct? It was not filed contemporaneous for the sole purpose That's of- That's not what I'm asking you, counsel. Was, well, it filed, was it filed and does it address uh, the language, the the requirements to support a motion to vacate. It did not go to the merits of a motion to vacate. However, we had requested, and there has not been heard, an evidentiary hearing on the motion to vacate. But isn't, it ask you a question. isn't there a requirement that an affidavit in support of a motion to vacate alleging an excusable neglect the meritorious defenses be supported by an affidavit? All of the evidence was filed supporting at the time was filed as attachments. So there's record evidence. Was, there, was, an affidavit, was there an affidavit that established a foundation as business records or something that would allow documents that you submitted into the record somehow having an evidentiary value? No, and that would be the purpose of having the evidentiary hearing was to admit evidence in support of. Okay, so, so your position is that a defendant has no obligation to file a supporting affidavit the defendant can simply sit back and say, I want an evidentiary hearing and we'll bring a witness and we'll let you know what they're going to testify to when they testify. That's your position? The motion had been very- is that your, is that, You're telling me you wanted an evidentiary hearing. Do you have any case support that says you do not have to file uh, a supporting affidavit? You can simply say, we'll come in on a day of an evidentiary hearing and we'll let you know what our grounds to uh, vacate and what evidence we have to vacate at that point in time. Is there any case that says that? 
my understanding is that, that it must be supported by evidence. I'm not aware of a case. I would have to submit a supplemental memoranda on that specific issue because I have not that for today. I think Judge Libert, you had you had a question. So I just the question about the evidence you're hearing. I'm troubled by that. The your reliance on a letter that we don't have that wasn't filed, and there's a procedure in the rules for reconstructing facts that aren't otherwise apparent on the record. And for you to say, particularly after the trial judge at the conclusion of the June hearing, where he said, "I'm going to enter the final judgment, and I invite you." to file a 1.540B motion and set it for an evidentiary hearing to say to you're hanging part of your hat here on the fact that you requested an evidentiary hearing, a matter of which there is no record and putting aside whether when you would have to line up your evidentiary ducks and how in support of this motion, I'm troubled by that because it seems to me that if you were going to make if that's a piece of what you're relying on, it would have been easy enough to file the letter. Um, it would have not, I don't know how easy it would have been to get your opponent to agree to this, but it would the procedure to avail yourself of a reconstruction of that event under the rule was available. And it doesn't appear that either of those was attempted. So we've got a couple of record deficiencies. The affidavit supporting disc or the verification of the disqualification motion isn't going to get you anywhere on the vacatur or setting aside. And the idea that you presumably would have or did ask for an evidentiary hearing but didn't get one is pretty speculative given lack of record and the fact that the judge specifically contemplated that that would be the next step and suggested it to you. Ms. Hall, uh, let me just let you know, we're into your rebuttal time. You can take 30 seconds and answer that and I'll preserve your rebuttal time. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, with regard to that, uh, looking at the record of its, in and of itself that we do have in front of us on appeal, the motions were filed and there was not an evidentiary hearing that was granted. There was not one held. So that absence of a record is what we relied upon um, as far as the record goes. Very good. Mr. Upson. You may proceed. May please the court, Keith Upson for Appellee Lisa Caviola. The argument I had prepared for this morning was exclusively limited to the absence of affidavits or sworn statements in the record as to those three, um, three elements, the excusable neglect, meritorious defense, or, or do, and due diligence. Um, in light of the argument so far, my sense is that that, would be, that argument would be repetitive. I think the court appreciates the points that I was gonna try and make. Uh, I've never done this, I've never seen it done. Um, I can spend my time if the court would like me to, but because my sense now is that the court already has an appreciation of the argument that I wanted to make, I don't see any sense in, in consuming the rest of my, my time. And unless the panel has any questions for me, uh, I'll ask you one question, Mr. Upson. Uh, opposing counsel has made the argument that they asked for an evidentiary hearing and they were prepared to go forward at the time of an evidentiary hearing. Is an evidentiary hearing uh, something that would be done in these circumstances? I mean, you've, you've handled a lot of appeals. I think you've handled appeals of these natures or of this nature in the past. Is there any mechanism by which a party who seeks to set aside a default does not have to file supporting affidavits and can basically request a hearing, an evidentiary hearing. Are you aware of any authority for that? I'm not, Your Honor, and it seems inconsistent with um, Bank of New York Mellon versus P2D2 cited in our answer brief that the party seeking to vacate the default bears the burden of establishing those three things. It, it, this court, and Bank of New York said by affidavit or sworn statement setting forth the facts. Um, I, I'm not aware of, of any authority that examines whether or not those two filings are to the exclusion of in-person I, I can help you out with that. Doesn't uh, Bank of New York Mellon versus Peterson say that granting such a motion without evidence and um, evidence emphasized to support the ruling is an abuse of discretion? Going to defer, if, if the 
Your Honor, if you have the full text in front of you, of course, the text of this court's decision is what it is. I, I don't have the full text at my fingertips, but I don't have any reason to suspect that what you just read, Your Honor, is not exactly what this court found. You may proceed with uh, whatever else you wish to argue, Mr. C. I, I was simply going to invite any questions from the panel, Your Honor, and otherwise rely on the argument and authority contained in the answer brief. Hearing none, and we will turn back to Ms. Hall for her rebuttal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honors. With regard to the issues of the affidavits or sworn statement, looking at Bank of New York Mellon, and again, there is record evidence that supports the finding of excusable neglect. It has been filed. There was not an evidentiary hearing that was- Wait, 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 stop. Your contention is that filing emails and pleadings is the same as submitting evidentiary support? Yes, Your Honor, emails and supporting documents are evidentiary support. Now, whether or not- what they if they're, they're not the authenticated, and that's- uh, Right, which is the next point that I was getting to. Whether or not they were authenticated in the motion is not something that was done. However, hence the request for the evidentiary hearing. As I sit here today, I'm not aware of anything that requires that the evidence be submitted much in the same fashion as a motion for summary judgment, where it must well, be- That's what evidence generally means. I mean, you can't move for summary judgment, attach a bunch of documents and say, I'll bring my affidavit or my witness to the hearing. The idea is to have evidence that is in the record when you get to the hearing, not to be playing some game with what might the evidence become. And the- there is still, again, the affidavit that was filed, not contemporaneous with, there is contemporaneous emails and other correspondences in support of the motion. And it is not the summary judgment rule, which makes it very clear what must be done in order to have it established. And in fact, an evidentiary hearing on a motion for summary judgment is very strictly defined and that there's not going to be evidence taken or submitted. And my understanding and review of the law is that that's not the point. It's a paper hearing with authenticated evidence that's been authenticated for submission to be considered as evidence, much like a hearing in this setting would be. And I'm not aware of any authority that indicates that there is not, it would not be accepted at an evidentiary hearing to submit further evidence in support of a motion to vacate. And the issue of which has gone largely overlooked in the appellee's responsive brief is that counsel for Caviola, Caviola, excuse me, affirmatively represented that he would not file a request for a final default until the issue of representation had been sorted out, which- You, you think that email is an affirmative representation that he won't file a motion for default? That's what, you, that's what you want us to read out of that email? Yes, the request was made please hold off until I find out if I'm representing defendant Parisi. And he, for six months, the question of whether you were representing Parisi had been open and generally negative because that was the first question that was asked when the complaint was filed. So how much longer was he supposed to wait? He had I had requested that counsel for Parisi wait until I figure out whether I'm retained and representing and have the authority to represent Parisi on a new case with the identical issues. And the response was, will do. So attorneys have been and always have been entitled to rely on the representations of counsel, which in this case did not happen. So that is also an issue that Parisi has raised in her appeal. Before we conclude, I want to ask one question regarding the motion to disqualify. In paragraph, you set out a number of factors in the motion, and then you attach transcripts which you suggest contain the statements ev evincing the unfair prejudice by Judge Kyle. Was it your expectation that Judge Kyle and now this court on appeal would comb through the transcripts to find what statements you contend provide an objectively reasonable basis for disqualification? No, Your Honor, the paragraphs in the verified motion to disqualify, I believe it's paragraphs 26 and 27 indicate exactly 
what the allegations were and the transcript attached was highlighted with the relevant portion. So they would have been um, pages five, six, seven, and nine um, were the highlighted statements made by the trial court. The, the one statement that you seem to be referring to is at the end of paragraph 26, where the judge scoffed in disbelief that the defendant did not understand the service process. And that was highlighted on page nine of the attached transcript. Very good. If there are no other questions, then that concludes the time. Thank you both very much. You may exit the courtroom. The next case is Greenspire Global versus Sarasota Green Group.